The American humorist Mark Twain once said that there are two kinds of speakers, those who get nervous and those who are liars. It's not difficult to understand why being asked to speak for 12 minutes is notionally more attractive than being asked to speak for much longer. But Mark Twain also said, or rather apologized to a friend for writing him a long letter because he didn't have time to write him a short one. And that's the interesting thing about 12 minute presentations. In reality, they require you to think very hard about what it is you want to say, to take the many things that you could possibly talk about and edit them down to no more than a few, hopefully, meaningful points. The limitation on time compels you to make your points simply and succinctly in order to communicate what it is you want to say as effectively as possible. And there, there is a parallel, I think, before I lose my notes, with what it takes to conceive of and implement good security practice. Security that is effective, security that works in actually protecting seafarers, is security that has been really well thought through in the first place. If you accept that premise, then we have to ask why so much of what we're trying to achieve security-wise is often wrapped up in biblical length procedures where the original intent gets lost in the inclination toward quantity over quality. Why much of the security equipment and measures employed are not particularly effective at doing what we evidently need them to do. And why we plow on, on the basis of a legacy of ideas that might have been appropriate 10 or 15 years ago without act, uh, asking how relevant and effective they are now and are likely to be in the near future. Let me give you an example. If there was a bomb threat against this building now, we'd all be evacuated and moved to a distance away, considered safer should an explosion occur, or at least you hope we would be, right? What won't happen is everyone in this room being asked to form into search parties to try and locate the bomb, because that is patently not safe. Our lives would be at risk, and that's unacceptable. In contrast to that, simulated bomb searches feature prominently in the list of ship security drills conducted by crew. By implication, if there was a bomb threat against a ship, or crew genuinely believed they were in a situation where it was likely that a bomb might have been placed on board, the crew would go and search for it. The nature of the drill implies that they wouldn't evacuate the ship, rather they would go and look for the bomb. Now, I know we accept that being at sea is in any event more hazardous than working in an office environment, but if you think about it, having crew search for a potential bomb is just crazy. In their shoes, would you want to go on a bomb hunt? No. I'm sure you'd rather get as far away from it as possible and leave dealing with the threat to someone who's actually trained to. The drill has its genesis in the ISPS code. Bomb risks are clearly a security issue, and it's sensible that we consider the risk thoroughly. But I am pretty sure that the idea of having crew searching for bombs is not the right response to the issue. Indeed, it seems to me that there are quite a few things that are being done on board ships under the auspices of security, which are not the right solutions to the problems they're designed to address. I don't say that flippantly, or because I want to be com controversial particularly. However, as someone who's been working in the area of countering maritime crime and developing security responses to it for more than 20 years, before maritime security was a thing, you might say, I'm certain that the measure of what we do on board ship, security-wise, has to be its effectiveness first and foremost. So thinking long and hard about why we are, where we are, I think I've hit on something possibly which has come to me from all places but the world of marketing and advertising, where for a number of years some marketers have been studying behavioral sciences in an effort to understand how humans perceive value, how we make choices between products and services, and why we like some things surprisingly more than we like others. And if you're interested in all that, do look up on the internet Rory Sutherland of the Ogilvy Group and Richard Shotton, author of a book called The Choice Factory, because they've got some fascinating and entertaining insights to offer. 
Anyway, what I've read across from some of the work going on in that area is how the choices we make and the decisions we take are in many ways a function of our personal and professional biases. In other words, the psychological prism of prejudices and proclivities through which we see the world. And I've come to the conclusion that we've got an unwieldy mass of questionable effective security practice because of three particular biases. And I call them the compliance bias, the conformity bias, and the cost bias. Are we complying with regulations and guidance? Is this what everyone else is doing? How much is it going to cost? And are we willing to pay for it? And if we re revisit the bomb search scenario in those terms, I think you can see how it comes into play. Does the drill meet the compliance test? Well, yes. It's an accepted security drill that we can regu uh, regularly and readily undertake and log for audit purposes. Does it conform to what everyone else is doing? Yep, you'll find it in the security procedures of a lot of ships. What's the cost of doing it? Nothing. It doesn't cost a penny, which pleases the budget holders. Another example where I think the biases are evident is in ship security alert systems. The idea behind SSAS is a good one, the principal purpose being for the crew of the ship to be able to alert relevant people ashore that the security of the ship is under threat or that it has been compromised. But I think there's a disconnect between the original idea and how SSAS works or doesn't in practice. And I suspect this disconnect is the result of compliance, conformity and cost biases. Regulation 6 of the ISPS code, which deals with ship security alert systems, says, the system shall be capable of being activated from the navigation bridge and at least one other location. This, I would argue, has been largely interpreted to mean you should have two points of activation for the ship security alert system on your ship. I'd like to raise, if you could raise your hands, how many activation points do you have on your ships? Is it two? How many do you have on your ship? Two? Anybody got more than two? Okay, well, why have we got two mostly? Because that's what the regulation says. And I think that is the compliance bias kicking in. I'd also argue that the conformity and cost biases are also involved. Two points of activation is mostly what everyone else is doing, excepting those of you that are doing more. And obviously, having more points of activation would cost more money, albeit probably not very much. But what happens if the crew member that discovers that the security of the ship is under threat or has been compromised is not on the navigation bridge or anywhere close to the second activation point? At best, precious time is lost activating the ship security alert system, and at worst, it is not activated at all, which kind of makes the point of SSAS redundant. Regulation 6 also says that the activation points, and this is one of my favorites, shall be designed so as to prevent the inadvertent initiation of the ship security alert system. So not only, in my opinion, are there too few activation points on most ships, the regulation is in, written in such a way so as to disincentivize activation of the system in the first place. It's more concerned with not activating the system accidentally than it is activating it at all which I think is totally crackers. What is worse, an alert being issued accidentally and which spins up a few people ashore for 20 minutes or so, but who can be stood down with a sigh of relief, or an alert not being issued when there is a problem and no one ashore being in a position to respond during those first few crucial hours of an actual security incident. What I think is missing in both of these examples and in the way that maritime security is being delivered on board ships more widely is the absence of a security bias. And what I mean by that is prioritizing the effectiveness of the security that is being put in place on board ship above doing things because they tick a box on a checklist or because that's the way everyone else is doing it or because of budget diktats. The fundamental problem with the compliance, conformity and cost biases is they don't demand to know if what is being done is right. Think about it this way. Here is a car, but it obviously has no wheels, which is why it's on bricks. And I apologize, it's a German car that just happened to be the one that I found on the internet. Apart from the fact that it has no wheels, let's say it meets all the requirements for the Department of Transport tests 
for safety in the environment. Let's also assume that everyone else has a car that is up on bricks. So in the sense, we're doing the same thing as everyone else is doing, and let's assume that it will cost us money to get new wheels for the car. It looks like a car, so we call it a car. The problem is it doesn't do the one thing we expect a car to do, and that is get us from point A to point B. Without four wheels, it's not a functioning car, it's a piece of installation art. To the same extent, surely delivering security that works, delivering security that is really effective in protecting seafarers is the first priority of security. If when we think about how we deliver security, we do so with a bias towards how effective it is and what is needed to make it work, we'll be asking the right question at the outset. The answers to those questions might, or rather will, be uncomfortable. The issues are usually pretty gritty. How best to protect the lives and well-being of seafarers is challenging, and it demands that we think hard about what we're doing in order that we get it right. But that is how good security practice evolves. I've talked at conferences before about how and why I think maritime security priorities are distorted. And in no way would I suggest that getting security right is easy. If it was easy, then everyone would be doing it, and maybe the 24 seafarers abducted from ships operating off West Africa over the last four weeks would not have been. Maybe we could put a substantial dent in the stowaway numbers and the $15 million it costs the shipping industry each year in dealing with it. Neither am I suggesting that we ignore compliance, conformity, and cost. There are regulations that must be met. It is important that we act as an industry together, and there's no getting away from the cost pressures that shipping labors under. However, if we let these biases prevail over the security bias, we actually retard the development of best and better practice. We deter innovation in a seascape where security risks are evolving and seafarers need protection accordingly. I'm certain that it's possible to improve the security that is being delivered on board ships, and dare I say it, we can probably do so more cost effectively than is being done at present. We just need to give it more thought. These are my contact details. Do feel free to get in touch because I am genuinely interested in what you think. Thank you.